Hello everyone, I'm Zach Kircher, and you're watching Kircher Talks Entertainment. So, the Paris Summer Olympics ended on Sunday, August 11th. Or did they? No, they did not, dear viewer, because the Summer Olympiad is not over until I say it is over. You want to know why? Because while all of those buffed up athletes were off trying to set records and win medals in podunk France, I stayed behind in the blazing hot Phoenix Valley to cover the event that really matters ranking the best sports movies ever made. And yeah, while I do have a fondness for sports as a whole, my channel is dedicated to movies and video games. Therefore, talking about the best sports movies out there is my way of contributing to the larger conversation about athletic achievement. And in that spirit, I'm not going to be ranking movies in a typical, like, top 10 sort of way, no. In the spirit of the Olympics, since I am judging an Olympic event after all, I am handing out medals. Yes, these movies will be given bronze, silver, and gold medals, and I will also be giving the overall champion of this video the prestigious olive wreath, as they did in the original Olympic Games back in ancient times. Now, what does it mean for a movie to get a certain medal? Well, I will be evaluating all of these movies on four loose criteria. How good of a movie it is in general, how much the story innovates on well-worn sports movie tropes, the depth and accuracy by which each sport is represented, and how much it impacted me personally. After considering all of these things, a movie being handed a bronze, silver, or gold medal really just depends on how strongly I feel about it. Without further ado, let's dive straight into it. I'm going to be acting a little bit off the cuff when talking about all these various movies though, so bear that in mind as we go along, and I also want to give some participation awards first to Bull Durham, Happy Gilmore, and Million Dollar Baby. These are all movies that I definitely appreciate, but just not quite strong enough in order to make the official ranking, but you know, I enjoy all of them and I know a lot of people do as well, so I at least just wanted to give credit where credit was due. Alright, so I may be cheating a little bit and bringing up two movies to start things out, but I am going to be including both Cars and Surf's Up first and foremost because they are kind of the same movie. You know, you have two sports movies that are essentially about a young rookie who has a passion for the sport that he grew up in, but he needs to learn to kind of slow down and take things a bit more deliberately in his approach, while also just being a little less self-centered, a little more, I guess you could say, aware of the people around him, and then being taken under the wing of an older mentor who also, at one point or another, decided to walk away from the sport that he grew up loving. Yes, there are a lot of similarities between either one of these movies, but each of them have their own different qualities that really make me keep coming back to them. Surf's Up, for one, I think is just a really funny movie. One that has a killer soundtrack. One that I've kept coming back to on like Spotify and then playing on Clone Hero every now and then. And Cars is not quite as funny or even narratively satisfying as Surf's Up would be, but I think that one has a much stronger theme to it. The theme of slowing down, quite literally for a Cars case, and then just kind of taking life as it comes, I think is more impactful, but also just as someone who is from Arizona, where Radiator Springs is based, I think that just has a more deeper personal significance for someone like me. In either case, both movies depict their sports very well and make them very exciting to watch. With surf ups, sequences, you know, surfing against the huge waves are fun and exciting on their own. And then cars, I mean, like, I don't really care for NASCAR racing as it is. And so the fact that Cars makes all of these sequences exciting and places the camera right in the action as it's taking place, I think adds a lot of depth and excitement to those movies. So yes, I will be given Cars and Surf's Up bronze medals. Now people might look back on heavyweights as something that is taking a very serious subject, that being, you know, child obesity and making something that really just makes light of that issue. But as someone who grew up with this movie, you know, struggles a little bit with weight myself and also just, you know, trying to take the movie in for what it is, I think Heavyweights has much more intent behind it than people might immediately assume because while yes, there are a lot of jokes that are made at the expense of, you know, people who are overweight, most especially kids, it's all in good fun, but also the movie still recognizes that it is important to work towards health, trying to be your best self. The movie doesn't shy away from that, but also it is very much a movie that is promoting happiness among those who, you know, maybe aren't quite as physically fit as others, allowing us to accept them for who we are while also wanting them to grow and move past their struggles rather than someone like Tony Perkis who, while being a very funny and entertaining villain played by Ben Stiller, who takes fitness and health so seriously that it is at the great detriment to the well-being of those who are in Camp Hope. 
Now, when talking about it in a sports context, heavyweights isn't necessarily about one particular sport. I would say it's more so about physical fitness than anything else. But I included it ultimately in the video because, you know, of the whole sequence in the end, the climax that is involved with the Apache Relay. So I guess you could say it loosely ties in because of that. But for all the other reasons I mentioned, you know, it's themes about, you know, taking fitness in a very healthy and balanced way, you know, with nutrition and having good habits. I think there's a lot to glean from this movie, both positively in a thematic sense, but also just being a great time. It's one of the best family comedies of the 90s, most especially from Disney. And it gets a bronze medal. Now, as you can see behind me, um, we filmed some footage at what is known as the Home Run Stadium in East Mesa. I'll include a link in the description for anyone who lives in Mesa and wants to check it out. It's an old-fashioned batting cage center that's in Mesa, and one that we wanted to capture some footage for to tie into this particular section where I'm talking about a league of their own. Yes, as you can see, you know, there's footage of both my wife and my mom hitting some baseballs um, in the cage there. I, w I thought it would be a nice little tie-in because, you know, a league of their own is famous for being a sports movie about the all-female baseball league that came up during World War II. And while it takes a lot of fictional liberties with that story, it's just a great time at the movies. It's very straightforward in its approach. I guess you could say it's kind of predictable and reliant on sports movie tropes, but it works primarily because it is as funny as it is. The performances are all great, Gina Davis and Tom Hanks most especially. And then it also depicts baseball in a very effective way. As someone who loves the sport so much, I care deeply and seeing a movie that really understands how dirty and how intricate and how very strategic the sport can be. The filmmaking does a great job at depicting that and everything that it does. You can see the effort being put into all the pitches that are being made. You can see all of the actresses sliding across the dirt and probably getting some really nasty bruises as a result of it especially for the attire they have to wear. <laughs> and it's just a really good story. You know, um, one, again, like I said, is beholden to some tropes and cliches of the sports movie genre, but it does well enough on its own to, to establish its own reputation. And despite it being kind of, you know, reliant on some of those traditional storytelling elements, it is innovative in the sense that, you know, we didn't get movies of this caliber as much with a female cast. And A League of Their Own is definitely one of the best, even to this day, that has that sort of trademark quality of it. And that's why I'm giving it a bronze medal. <coughs> and now for another baseball movie, we've got Major League. What I love about Major League is I mean, it's just hilarious. It has a lot of jokes that could be construed as offensive, jokes that play into stereotypes, but when the jokes are delivered this well, I don't care. Consider that insensitive if you want, but I think Major League just does so well with all of its, you know, jokes and its humor at the character's expense, and it's not really like targeting any specific group in general. It takes kind of a South Park approach in that sense, where it makes shots at everyone that's at its cast. But also on top of that, you know, I really appreciate what the story is trying to say. Like A League of Their Own, it depicts baseball in a very tactile and a very authentic way. In a greater sense, you know, you have the story where, you know, a bunch of misfits come together to you know, make an MLB baseball team, the Cleveland Indians at the time, and you have this owner who cares not a lick for baseball. They want to relocate the team over to Florida for financial reasons, and so you have this really good sense of stakes that come between the team actually trying to get better and you have like the the corporate side of things that is really trying to take advantage of the situation and butt heads with the team and that creates for a good story where you know you have these athletes who really want to try to turn things around in their lives and make something better even if the odds are stacked against them and so you have a movie that succeeds at being funny but also has this you know story that you can get behind and that's why i'm giving it a bronze medal now for the Smash Brothers, which this is the only movie in this entire video that is going to be about something that isn't strictly sports, or rather sports in the traditional sense. In this case, the Smash Brothers is about the evolution of esports, specifically within the realms of the Super Smash Brothers games, Melee in particular. This four hour long documentary, which you can actually find on YouTube in multiple parts, really does well to shine a light on how esports is just as valid of a way for kids to get involved with something greater than themselves as, you know, athleticism is. It's just a different kind of, you know, thing that people can pursue and get better at and actually, you 
know, find genuine success in. I appreciate that the Smash Brothers is great at depicting that in a very entertaining and well-paced way. In a larger sense, I think the Smash Brothers is great in emphasizing how esports and just, you know, video games in general can provide a great community for people, you know, when played under the right circumstances. You see a whole entire community, you know, on the East Coast in particular, get fostered around people just loving the game that, that they're playing together and wanting to make something greater with it. And now we have a whole entire competitive scene for Super Smash Brothers where people can earn thousands if not millions of dollars off of. And then, you know, tournaments get thrown together all across the country and even the world where people can come together, enjoy the game that they all love so much in a community way. And yeah, people can compete just like how they do with sports. The Smash Brothers is great in bringing that to light. And I think anyone, regardless of their history with the, the games themselves, could appreciate what this movie is trying to say. And that is why I'm giving it a bronze medal. ourselves in the Finch Park racquetball court. Now, I am not talking about a movie that is about racquetball, but I am talking about a movie that is focused on tennis. The only tennis movie that is going to be featured in this whole video, and that movie being Challengers. Now, out of every movie that I'm going to be featuring in this video, this is the newest one, having only released in theaters back in April, but the fact that I am talking about it should speak to its overall quality because while this certainly is a very fun and engaging and well-filmed movie about tennis, the tennis matches themselves being very, very cinematic, what makes this so powerful of a movie and just a great story in general is that it's focused on relationships. Relationships that are filtered through this metaphor of the game of tennis itself. You know, the fact that people are volleying balls between each other and they have this intense relationship on the tennis court is emblematic of all of the differing drama and tension that is present between the three main characters. The main character being the one played by Zendaya, and then the other two male lead characters, played by Josh O'Connor and Mike Feist, who those two being, well all three of them really being, in this entrenched love triangle that spans over years. And yeah, just the trauma that comes out of that and this non-linear story that all compounds in this awesome climactic tennis match that's kind of spread throughout the movie is very fun to watch. Uh, and so what I do really love about this particular sports drama is that it balances between, you know, excellent scenes of the tennis game of tennis being played itself. But for anyone who comes into this wanting just some good, delicious, you know, soap opery type drama that's done very well, Challengers does that exceptionally well. It's one of the best movies that's come out in 2024 so far, and it's also one of the best sports movies. I am going to be giving it a silver medal. Now, I didn't talk about Field of Dreams in my video about James Earl Jones, but I certainly did reference it. Field of Dreams is something that definitely means a lot to me personally for the kind of Again, connection I have with it, with it being about baseball. I've actually visited the real life field of dreams, you know, the, the set, but also the actual legitimate field that's in Dyersville, Iowa. Like a lot of movies within the sports genre, but most especially within this video that I'm mentioning, it is one that is very beholden to, I guess you could say cliches, but also, you know, romanticism and wish fulfillment, you know, something that appeals to the sentimental side of, of all of us, you know, for those who can, you know, certainly lean into that sentimental side. But Feel the Dreams works as well as it does because its characters are written so well. They're all ones that you can genuinely get behind. And ultimately, in the end, what I appreciate about it is everything that kind of pieces together throughout its narrative, you do have to kind of trust that it does come together in a very cohesive way by the end. And it does, most especially in that iconic finale where you kind of see why Ray Kinsella is having all of these visions and these voices in his head trying to do all of these outlandish things. And it all speaks to this larger theme about how not just baseball players, a whole lot of people have these dreams that they never got to see realized in their lives. And Feel the Dreams is kind of an ode to all of those people in giving them a second chance at life, at the things that they were passionate for. And it's very meaningful in that sense. And I think a lot of people can find a catharsis in that. And I'm sure people certainly have across the years. And it's one that I still very much do as well, um, and one that I think I will continue to cherish as I continue to delve deeper into this new avenue of my life, which is fatherhood. So 
it means a lot to me in that sense, and I think it will continue to mean a lot. And for all those reasons and more, it gets a silver medal. sweet ride huh well it's actually not my ride but needless to say um, this right here is a 2009 Ford Mustang the likes of which um, the family of Mustangs is featured very prominently in a sports movie well rather a racing movie that was directed by James Mangold Ford v Ferrari now what do I really like and appreciate about Ford v Ferrari well for one thing Racing is not something that I normally gravitate to, you know, like NASCAR racing, for example, but something that film is able to do for racing that, you know, televised sports can't do for me is make it compelling and interesting. You know, you have all the abilities to be able to make compelling shots and then, you know, wide angles, you know, you can cut fast in between shots to make the action even more interesting. And that's something that Ford v Ferrari very much so does. This is a very, very well directed movie, especially in the, the third act of the film where the big race at Le Mans in France takes place over a 24 hour period. But aside from that, you know, at its core, there's a very deeply human story at the center. Yes, it's also, you know, very much so promoting like Shelby Ford Mustangs and then of course, you know, all the things that are and tied in with that. So you would think it would be some kind of like propaganda for Ford vehicles, but it isn't. At its core, it's about men who are trying to reconcile, you know, their own dreams and their own voice, you know, while also being trapped by corporatized people who are trying to snag up their success and make it of their own. And you have this very interesting story between these men who are trying to claim what is rightfully their own, while also, you know, they chase after their passions and their dreams and things don't exactly go the way they want them to. I think there's a lot of great human truth that is inherent in that story and how it plays out. While it's also just great fun to be had at the movies, you know, as a, as someone who is officially a dad now, you know, I can officially say that I have the justification to appreciate dad movies, the likes of which Ford v Ferrari definitely is one. Um, I would have liked it even if I wasn't. Um, categorized that way, but needless to say, a very fun racing movie, and I'm giving it a silver medal. All right, I think a lot of people would agree that Warrior is certainly one of the best sports movies ever made, and for good reason. It takes what you would consider to be a standard sports movie story structure, that being of underdogs, and it applies them into a Shakespearean sort of style of narrative, where you have all of these characters with all of these deep-rooted familial conflicts and places them in a situation to where they do have to ultimately butt heads. But you can also understand where everyone is coming from, you know, most especially the three main characters, the two brothers that are played by Tom Hardy and Joel Edgerton, and then their father played by Nick Nolte. All three of them have their own unique weaknesses and strengths and desires that make it so, you know, maybe one person might lean to their side or the other in this bout for fame and glory and money. You really can understand where everyone comes from. Their drama is so well realized, so well portrayed by the actors. You don't want all of them to be happy no matter the outcome. And the movie does very well to let the audience feel as though this is a situation that they can get behind and one that they can relate to. Like for a PG-13 movie about MMI fighting, this is some pretty intense Tense action that you will see, one that works very well in a cinematic sense, but also a dramatic sense, um, which feeds very well, most especially into the climactic fight, which I won't spoil, but I think anyone who kind of understands what this movie is going for there. Needless to say, um, excellent movie, and I will be giving it a silver medal. Okay, we're getting into the real good stuff now. Everything that I'm mentioning in the in the gold medal section is like 9 or 10, like 9 out of 10 or 10 out of 10 level for me. So we're going to start off with another cheat, that being Creed and Rocky. 
two films from the same franchise, but I am going to be including both of them because they do share a very, very similar story structure between the two of them, even down to individual plot points and how those plot points come to fruition. But I'm still going to include both of them because they are both as successful of an issuing of the standard like underdog story that you could find. They're just super well executed in all sense, like visuals, performances, writing, themes, everything. But I think both of them have their own things that they want to say about overcoming their social standing in life and the expectations that are thrust upon them. And they both, in that sense, have their own cultural undertones to them. Rocky being about something that Sylvester Stallone himself could probably relate to, being an Italian-American trying to find his own way in life. And then for Creed, you know, you have someone who, I guess you could say he has a lot of fortune in life, you know, after he's taken in by Apollo Creed's widow. But in a grander sense, I think what Creed does that Rocky doesn't is just delve a little bit more into this notion of trying to overcome whatever negative expectations are thrust upon you and prove that you can craft your own legacy despite what came before you. Each movie has their own unique message that they want to share while also being wrapped up in these very exciting narratives about boxing and trying to get to the peak of athleticism, if you will. In any case, both of these movies are incredible among some of the best, you know, certainly sports movies you'd get out of Hollywood, I am going to be giving both of them very well-deserved gold medals. <coughs> Alright, now we get to a movie that is very much deserving of having been put on my top 10 list for the year of 2023, and that is the first Slam Dunk. There have been a lot of sports-themed anime throughout the years, but this is the only one I'm going to be mentioning for the simple reason that it takes basketball in a direction that I have never seen depicted on the screen before. Not just for the fact that it's, you know, traditionally animated for the most part, but it does this very cool thing where, unlike other anime films where the CGI is terrible, it takes all of these motion capture, you know, character models, and then it mixes them with the line art that you would find to kind of emphasize action and manga comic panels themselves. It also uses a lot of kinetic camera movements to emphasize action, movement, adrenaline, and sweat. You really feel like you are on this court, like dribbling the ball with these guys as they're going back and forth from one end of the court to the next. And it's exhilarating. The great thing is, is you don't have to wait until the end of the movie to see all of this spectacular sports action. The way that the movie is structured is that you have the finale of the movie is kind of played in chunks throughout the rest of the story where you get a little bit of the game here you get to slow down a little bit for some backstory and then that cycle just sort of repeats until the end between all of those things the first slam dunk again like many, so many other movies on this list takes a pretty I guess you could say standard story structure and even has some cliched moments you might see coming but it's all depicted with such genuine love and authenticity for the sport you can tell that the people who created this, you know, manga and then eventually anime, truly intrinsically care about what sports can do for people, you know, helping them to find a way to overcome some of the, the struggles of their lives, you know, channel all of their frustration and their desires into the sport that they so desperately want to be good at. That enthusiasm and that energy is just so prevalent in this capital S shonen anime to end all shonen animes. It is so exciting to watch, um, and if you have not heard of this movie, please seek it out. It is easily one of the most crowd-pleasing, entertaining movies of the past five years, and that is why I am giving it a gold medal. <coughs> now we move on to what is quite possibly the most butt-clenching movie of anything that is on this list, that being Free Solo. This movie is a documentary in which its main subject, Alex Honnold, prepared and then eventually executed, successfully might I add, a free solo climb of El Capitan in Yosemite National Park. For those of you who just heard me say that and are wondering what the heck those words meant, it basically is that Alex Honnold climbed a 3,000 foot sheer rock face with no harnesses or any equipment whatsoever. It was just him, his hands, and his shoes doing all of the work. The funny thing is, is this whole movie was made on the precipice of wondering whether Alex was going to live to see the day or not. And so the whole entire movie, you kind of have like this idea in the back of your mind that, yeah, he made it through. But it's so immersive and so great at getting you invested in Alex trying to prepare for the eventual climb at 
towards the third act of the movie, that you just kind of lose yourself in this man's journey of trying to, you know, achieve this great goal of his, no matter how risky it is. And within that, you kind of see how this guy uses his sport, uh, his chosen profession and sport of climbing, as a way to kind of delve into his, his psychology. And it's a very interesting movie in that sense. I mean, you might watch this movie and not end up liking <laughs> Alex Honnold by the end, but I think that's a true testament to the power of this story in the sense that it doesn't hold anything back from trying to depict him as who he is. You know, someone who just can't stop wanting to achieve more and to test his limits and to be the best possible climber that he can be. It makes for some truly fantastic and compelling cinema from start to finish. It was one of the craziest experiences I ever had watching a movie. You know, just like the tension and the suspense I felt. And even watching it at home, that tension is still felt. And I think you would experience that feeling too, which is why I am giving it a gold metal. Alright, so for this clip, I have invited my good friend Jazz to join me in on this because I'm gonna be we're gonna be talking about the Iron Claw, which is a movie that is all about professional wrestling, or rather the effects that professional wrestling had on a tragic family called the Von Eriks. And given that my friend Jazz is all about professional wrestling, I figured I'd invite him on for this particular segment, so both of us really love this movie. It was one of our favorite movies of 2023. But um, what specifically stood out to you about it? So I think the main thing, and it, like, without getting into the technical aspects of why I enjoyed it as a movie, uh, one thing that I loved that I was really worried about going into it is the respect that it has for the professional wrestling industry. Um, and not just, you know, in the direction and it being portrayed as like a real, not a joke, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, I think wrestling over the years has gotten a pretty bad rap uh, when it's displayed by other forms of entertainment as just being kind of a gimmick, but it's something that's really important to a lot of people, myself included. Um, and it, it's not just that it's taken seriously by the director. Um, you, you watch the interviews of the actors talking about professional wrestling. Jeremy Allen White has said that, I think Zac Efron potentially too, has said that he would be open to doing like wrestling shows if he was oh. given more time to prep. Cool. Um, they trained with Chavo Guerrero, who's like a, a legacy talent in the business. Um, and they trained for a long time to, uh, to really understand what they were doing. And I always love when that extra step is taken in movies and they, they just did it the right way. They, they paid respect to the people, um, that built the business. They didn't treat it like a joke. They, while their, their roles were kind of relegated to minor cameos, if that, um, they put wrestlers in the movie and that's, that's one of the things that I love the most about it. Okay. Yeah, and I think that's great that you bring that up because this movie is very sincere, which I think makes a huge difference for something like this that is tackling such a tragic story, which if you haven't seen this movie, I'm not going to spoil for you, but it is incredibly sad. It is. <laughs> um, and it's also a true story, which is, makes it even more unbelievable. But yeah, I, I just appreciate that this movie, while it is very, you know, authentic in its depiction of its sport, which I don't know as much as you, obviously, but um, it is very authentic, but it also is very grounded in human emotion. The fact that it is such a strong human drama in which the sports just kind of add a little bit of a layer of, um, I guess you could say, context to the relationships that you see unfold on camera. Yeah, it's just, it's a very touching story about familial relationships, about Toxic masculinity, which some people might be kind of off-put by just me saying that, but no, it really is a great story about that and kind of like overcoming those things that might cause you to be more toxic in your masculinity, which for, I know, for a guy like me, I can appreciate, especially now that I'm a dad myself. Um, and so both as a sports movie, it's great in and of itself, but as just a piece of cinema that really gets to the heart of its characters and the drama they're in, I think it's, I think it's amazing. And that's why I'm giving it a gold medal. Let's go. All right, so right behind me, we'll find Hohokam Stadium, the ballpark that the Oakland A's play at for spring training. Now, why have I chosen to film at this particular location? Well, that's because I am talking about Moneyball. The true story behind how in 2000, the 2002 MLB season, the Oakland Athletics decided to implement a very, at least at the time, controversial strategy of pivoting from typical recruiting, you know, for, for new baseball players 
and using statistics and analytics to build a baseball team. Now, what I really like about Moneyball, aside from the fact that it's well-directed, it's got great performances, and it has a killer script from Aaron Sorkin and St Steven Zalian, is the fact that it takes an, a typical type of underdog story for, you know, a team that is kind of in the muck and not really doing very well and then rising to the ranks and taking a very unique spin on it. You know, it's very clinical and it's not really focused so much on the sport of baseball itself. Well, it is, but you know, we're not watching a whole ton of games and seeing the team progressively get better in the traditional sense. You really kind of see the the background work that goes into professional sports, you know, the politics that go into, you know, the development of the team, all of the money that factors into it, and all of these things like that, and the, the insider perspective you get on that, as well as how much it factors into a personal story for its main character, Billy Bean, is something that really strikes a chord with me as someone who really likes math, business, and baseball. <laughs> This movie, in a way, is kind of made to appeal to all of my personal sensibilities, I guess you could say. Um, but on top of the fact that it's just a very strong drama with great characters, you know, definitely there's a lot of great things at stake here that I think makes an interesting case about going against the grain for sports, you know, looking at different things that people normally wouldn't care to look at. And so Moneyball is a very unique picture in that sense, but also one that is done very, very well. And that's why I'm giving it a gold medal. The final movie that I am giving a gold medal to is appropriate to me because it is one that kind of encapsulates everything that I feel, you know, nostalgic for with my childhood, and that is The Sandlot. Now, the funny thing about me saying that I feel nostalgic about this movie and sort of the feelings that it makes me have regarding my own upbringing is that, you know, obviously I didn't grow up in the 60s. I was a late 90s to, you know, early to mid 2000s kid. You know, that's kind of when I became who I am and eventually went into high school. But this movie gets at the universal idea, most especially for young boys, the need for a sense of belonging and a need of community to where you can experience life's troubles together. And it does that through the vehicle of baseball. I love that this movie captures how fun baseball can be when you're playing it with, you know, other people. But at its core, you know, it's using that love of that sport for something greater, which is, you know, friendship. Recounting memories of times gone by and what they can mean for your life. And it's just a very simple story, you know, one that has a ton of great humor, one that can stick with you long after the credits roll, and for lack of a better word, it's just full of love and it's charming. I very much so hold it very close to my heart on a very personal level. You know, there are some things about it to where I can kind of forgive some of its flaws because of how much I do genuinely connect with it even as an adult. And yeah, I don't really have anything truly negative to say about it. It's just one that works perfectly for me no matter how many times I watch it. And that is why I am giving it a gold medal. All right, now after all of that, you know, we still have one last movie to talk about. One film that matches up with pretty much everything I could ever want from a sports movie. Is it my absolute favorite? Maybe not. I'd probably have to watch it more in order to say if it really deserves to be my number one favorite sports movie of all time, because admittedly I only have seen it once for this video, in fact. But anything you could ever want out of just not a sports movie, but Anything in a movie in general is encapsulated by this wonderful achievement in filmmaking. And my dear viewers, that movie is... And so for the final movie I will be talking about in this video, I thought it would be appropriate to go back to my childhood home, as you've probably already seen in a couple of clips in this video. But for this specific part, tie it all back to a movie that deeply impacted me when I watched it, which is Hoop Dreams. You know, Hoop Dreams being a three hour documentary about two young black kids in the 80s and then the early 90s who, when they were in junior high and then going into high school, they aspired to become NBA stars. And that documentary in and of itself is, you know, it is long, yes, but its length is justified in watching these two guys, you know, endure life and as many challenges you know, going into high school and then trying to obtain state championships with their basketball, respective basketball teams. But as someone who's 
I mean, I like basketball, but you know, I'm not someone who's regularly gonna watch NBA games on, you know, TV or anything, so why would that movie be considered to be the best sports movie of all time, in my opinion? Well, for a lot of different reasons, you know, I just find it to be a very compelling watch that really strikes at the heart of the truth of what it means to really chase after your dreams, to wade through life's challenges, but it's filtered through a basketball lens. But there's just so much in that movie that speaks to the human experience, you know, how the fact that, you know, we have all these amazing dreams that we'd like to achieve, but there are things that get in the way of that, you know, whether it be family, whether it be sudden tragedies we have to deal with, in the case of sports, injuries, you know, life has its many different challenges that we have to go through. And for, regardless of whatever type of life experiences you have going into that movie, I think Hoop Dreams, at its very fundamental aspect, really just understands what it means to be human. And it's very empathetic. You know, you go into this movie hoping to see these guys achieve their dreams. And regardless of the outcome, you know, you want them to be happy. You want them to find true joy and success, just like you would any other person. And truly, I think that's what makes Hoop Dreams stand out among so many other movies, is that it really has an authentic idea of what basketball should be, but also what the human experience should be, and how we can all have happiness, and how we all deserve it. I didn't play basketball for a reason. And that's it. Thank you all for watching. Please do give a like and subscribe to the video if you enjoyed this, because it really does help my channel grow. And I will see you all in the next one.